Uh, I want to thank the Institute. Um, I am honored to be a part of this celebration recognition today, and I am indeed humbled to be in the presence of the other honorees. Um, thank you very much, and I'll leave the remarks to Doug. Well, uh, I didn't know that Chris was going to step up there and say a few things, so I'll leave out the, the uh, recognition of, of Chris. Um, but whatever I'm doing and have been doing and what we are doing in our work in South America and actually around the world in um, conservation and uh, agriculture, restoration, um, activism, uh, Chris is 60% of the team, so um, just so you know. However, we flipped a coin and I uh, won or lost, I have to do the talking today, so um, I'm going to uh, try to, um, how shall I say, I, I feel a little bit like the fox in the chicken house. Um, I'm not a, um, a cheerleader for the standard definition of progress. Um, and um, I want you to um, hopefully listen to me, but um, let these images, which are on a sort of a, a continuous loop here, um, they're images from a, a, a book that's just out, and I'll show it to you here. It's a uh, photo format book with, with a, a few uh, pertinent essays um, called Overdevelopment, Overpopulation, and Overshoot. And um, these images that you're going to see here, uh, by the way, um, this, this book will be a present to any one of you who would like it. Just have to, to, to give me your um, mailing address and we'll, we'll get it to you. Um, but it's another, it's another view of the, of the condition that we find ourselves uh, today. Um, and I think um, uh, hopefully with these pictures, uh, it can be disturbing, um, but they're set in the context of, of the remarks I'm gonna make in the next few minutes. So please don't be too distracted. Let them pour through your eyes as uh, I've tried to explain my way, as I tried to explain my way through this short presentation. Uh, for there will be the broad context of, of my remarks. Also, let me take advantage of having the microphone to mention that these photos are all from our most recent book that I just showed you. Um, and I confess that um, I'm not super well informed um, on the fine points of the work of the Institute, although I have a general idea of its history and work. Um, Chris and I are certainly flattered that our um, conservation and um, land restoration agricultural work um, has been recognized by the Institute and thus the prize that we have received. So we thank the, the jury or the committee that decided this and hope that we live up to expectations. Um, I know that we don't have too much time so I'd like to see if I can leave you all with, the, with an angle of reflection that will be difficult for many if not virtually all of you, to swallow. I say this both half, half jokingly and uh, half seriously. Uh, remember again to keep your eyes on the photos and, and hopefully an open ear to what I'll be trying to explain. What I'm proposing in its simplest and broadest form is nothing less than to imagine as, as a mental or thought exercise that the present economic model, the present worldview and epistemology that underlies and supports our now global techno-industrial free market infinite growth capitalism is, in short, entirely bankrupt and is taking the world to the, the brink of the precipice into the virtual abyss of history. That we are like a speeding train aimed at a massive rock wall and the train will hit that wall within a relatively short time. 
I know for, for a well that you're already thinking to yourselves that you're about to hear some kind of doomsday scenario, and you've already heard versions of it before. To a certain extent, you'll be right. You probably have heard doomsday scenarios. They abound all over. But I'm asking that you think of this first as a mental exercise and to park all judgments aside for the moment and to leave your most cherished, unquestioned assumptions in neutral. And remember the famous line by Eric Everton that the real authorities in a culture are the unquestioned assumptions. In order to process this quote-unquote experiment, it's also necessary to find some of the terms of the discussion. And I think they will be helpful for any number of economic, social, educational, ecological, or cultural exercises down the road. And for how one might deal with what I consider obvious conclusions. First of all, I'd like to remind everyone that less than 500 years ago, the world was thought to be flat and the earth was the center of our universe. Copernicus comes on the scene in the middle of the 16th century and produces a so-called Copernican revolution, showing that the earth was not the center, but the sun, and thus the heliocentric theory of the universe is born. This notion was enormously resisted, of course, and especially by entrenched and vested interests. It was a revolution in thinking and upset the status quo. It took a very long time to become accepted as a fact of life. Today, no one whatsoever questions the way the planets orbit. Paradigm shifts are always like this, taking long and agonizing shifts in thinking. Imagine that we are now 100 years out, or if you like, 200 years from now. It does not matter particularly, but that the myth of progress has become just that, an ancient myth. That the notion of ever developing mega technologies, including global capitalism as an economic mega technology, being the key to development has fallen from grace and we have made that paradigm shift to eco-local, eco highly diverse, and healthy, lightly populated economy, and that the Earth has recuperated from its dark times of biodepletion, and the climate is now stabilized. Beauty has returned everywhere. Wildlife populations are recovering, and evolution has jump-started itself after being stopped dead in its tracks and went backwards in the dark moments of the 20th in the 21st century. This thinking in your imagination is often helpful to deal with the unimaginable idea that our present way of life would change so radically and that there is a bright and glorious even light at the end of the long dark tunnel we find civilization in today. Also, I would like to straight off the bat mention a mental blocker that is skillful to remove from our thinking if we can and that is the idea that you cannot go back. This, of course, is rubbish, but it is a persistent excuse to wave aside the idea of devolving the very techno-industrial culture that we have already created for ourselves and setting off in another direction. Let me say that if you're driving somewhere and you find you're lost, that you're on the wrong road somehow, that you made a wrong turn at some point, there are several options. One is to continue on, the option of the hardhead usually, unwilling to admit his mistake. Another tactic is to ask directions, and often, often they result in actually turning back, going back the way you came. Also, you might just decide yourself to make a U-turn and go back to where you are on known ground again and start over. That is a sensible alternative which many of us choose when we find ourselves lost. We will come back to that, but this should loosen up your resistance to the notion that we cannot go back. Often, it is by far, by far the smartest thing to do. Now, I would, like, I would like to introduce a macro question, and that is to ask if anyone here believes that the techno-industrial culture, of which we are all children now, is a successful development model. Now, I know that there will be many who will raise their hands to point out many number of benefits and successes that this megatech society has already delivered. That also, we are now so committed to this trajectory 
that it is impossible to turn back now. My point here is to say that we are now back in the car, lost on some highway we do not recognize, and we have paused to stop and check our bearings. If we said that we were now so far along that we had no choice but to continue, and we explained that to our spouse sitting next to us, he or she would be giving us a lecture on our own stupidity. I will quote John Michael Greer, one of the sharpest thinkers and writers I know on the scene today when he says, there is nothing inevitable in the way we do things in today's industrial world. Our political arrangements, our economic practices, our social institutions, our cultural habits, our sciences and our technologies all unfold from industrial civilization's distinctive and profoundly idiosyncratic worldview. So does the central flaw in the entire Baroque edifice, our lethally muddle-headed inability to understand our inescapable dependence on the biosphere. But one question here I want to put to everyone is that if we are on the right road, that the techno-industrial culture is on the right road and so successful, how is it that we are immersed in the worst environmental crisis in the last 200 million years? That is, we are now in the sixth mass extinction event, and from all accounts of climate science, we have ruined the climate. What could be worse than this? In my view, we are lost. And what lies at the base of this getting lost and down the wrong road is our model of development. After all, what else was it that drove us to this point? The question is, how could we have gotten it so wrong? In my opinion, going back to the wrong road metaphor, we should turn around and get back to a place that we are more sure of where we are. This, of course, poses any number of problems for we are already immersed in the entire enchilada of, techno -industrial, of the techno-industrial juggernaut of forces that make up our daily lives. Agriculture is now dependent on an industrial model of chemicals, complicated machinery, giant confined animal feeding operations provide enormous amounts of chickens, eggs, hogs, cattle, milk. Land, agricultural land especially, is now concentrated in fewer and fewer hands many of them giant corporations, being managed from financial centers far from the farms themselves, bringing all kinds of problems to soils, to health, to biodiversity. Communications are now dependent on satellites, heavy and unhealthy electronic magnetic fields, travel and transport set into huge networks of roads, airline routes, trains of all of which our complicated infrastructure, not at, easy, not at all easy to change. Urbanization has redistributed once rural populations into megacities and sprawling slums of dimensions never seen before in all of human history. The internet at first flaunted as this miracle network of information that would liberate the underclass and democratize information, turned out to be the most centralizing mega technology she ever devised and has served primarily the interests of the transnational corporations, the crime syndicates, the extractive economy, drug traffickers, porno purveyors, and mass consumer culture more than any other invention in human history, ramping up economic, economic activity which is pillaging the planet and a major driver of climate change and the extinction crisis. Roll the clock back and you will easily see that without the internet, we would not be at the 400 plus parts per million of CO2 that we are today that is setting in motion dangerous chemical processes in the atmosphere that is unhinging the world's climate. The list could go on and on from antibiotic resistances to acidification in oceans to overfishing by mega technological industrial fishing fleets, loss of forest cover, dire water problems in aquifers or river systems, all propelled by the accelerating force of the internet, whose most significant contribution to civilization has been just that, acceleration, like a giant flywheel ready to come apart as it is spinning too fast for its size and construction. 
What I find, and because time at this event is limited, is to say that in my view, the systemic analysis, and I emphasize systemic, of mega technology is the weakest part of the social movements and a virtual disaster for the economists and purveyors of progress. What I believe, and what is healthy in my view, is that all our leadership, and I define leadership as the business class, the political class, authorities, academia, the press, all professionals, the church, NGOs, union leaders, architects, designers, and so forth, need to learn to be far more critical of mega technology and understand that all technologies arrive into the culture with inherent characteristics, and these intrinsic characteristics oblige, and I emphasize oblige, that society comports itself according to the dictates of that technology. We can see it very clearly by using a simple example of a society that embraces nuclear power. To embrace nuclear power, you have to have your society structured such that it is a centralized society, that it requires narrow specialists who lose the larger overview. You need a high capital society. You need to have a military of some sort. You have to have a constantly growing market. You have to have the entire scaffolding of civilization, as it is called which is the mining, the machines that do the mining, the machines that even made the mining machines, the smelters, the roads to the smelters, the roads to carry the metals to their markets, the trucks needed to do that, the communication systems to support it. The list goes on and on. That is the scaffolding of civilization, and it is that which is destroying the world, wiping out biodiversity, making the world ugly, changing the climate. Does that not give anyone with a few grams of common sense the incentive to rethink whether we are on the right road or not, and that perhaps we need to go back or turn around at least and take a step forward if you cannot bear to go back? So to this end, and this little thought experiment, this mental exercise I asked everyone to be thinking about, um, about how much of a disaster this failed experiment that we know as the Enlightenment and think about rethinking what we are doing and where we are headed with our much revered civilization and back away enough to see the famous bottom line. Dismally though, the bottom line is what we have ruined the climate and we have created the extinction crisis, mother of all crises. My view is that we need to rethink the entire notion of progress and figure out an entirely different development model, one in which nature is the measure and not the reductionist Cartesian logic that puts human cleverness ahead of the laws of nature and that we use, and that, we <coughs> and that uses the machine as model and not the organic nature model, an organic model rather than machine to rethink that's wor the worldview that humanity has foolishly adopted the sense of entitlement that allows us to transmogrify the planet with its techno-arrogance, to par paraphrase my friend and colleague Eileen Christ, another one of the thinkers I respect the most these days. Somewhere down the centuries, we took the wrong road, and we forged it on with false certainty and bullheadedness, and now we have driven countless species extinct extinct forever with our hubris and arrogance. That just does not seem at all intelligent. Economists, along with the rest of the leadership, need, in my opinion, a reassessment of worldview, one in which the primary ethical and ecologically intelligent position is to share the planet with other creatures and set our goals for a fulfilling life on other objectives than the format of the techno-industrial consumer culture. It is a big challenge, first, to our thinking and intellect. But just as John Greer says, there is nothing inevitable about the future. We made it a mess, but we have the abilities to make it right again. To that end, I want to read a poem that was written 2,500 years ago, where I find it an amazingly prescient short reminder that we can have a wonderful life, free of these things that are undoing our world. Note carefully how the subject of technology, population, 
meaningless, meaningless consumption, vanity, war or peace, beauty and simplicity are also our principal concerns today. I say, let's look for the right road and recognize that we somehow find ourselves lost and need to turn around and go forward. Better to keep your country small, your people few, your devices simple, and even those for infrequent use. Let people measure life by the meaning of death and not go out of their way to visit far off places with nowhere to travel and little care for the display of great ships and shining weapons become mere relics of the past. Let people recover the simple life, reckoning by knotted cords, delighting in a basic meal, pleased with humble attire, happy in their homes, taking pleasure in their rustic ways. So content are they that nearby towns so close, the sounds of dogs and roosters forms one chorus, folks grown gray with age may pass away, never having strayed beyond the village. Lao Tzu, thank you. <laughs>